And I always was interested in ethnomusicology. Uh, already when I was an undergraduate in Germany, uh, at my uh, conservatory, they didn't have an ethnomusicology program. But once I went to the University of Hamburg, I already took some uh, classes and uh, was very involved. But I think the main reason why I always was interested is that I spent formative years in Tanzania as a child. I was there for two years and I heard uh, music from all over Africa and it was extremely interesting for me. So I think that's the, the main reason. But this particular project uh, really has its background also in Tanzania. Uh, because when I was nine years old, we uh, moved to Tanzania for two years because my father was asked by the Lutheran World Federation uh, to uh, be director of a seminary which was supposed to educate future bishops from all over Africa. So we went, spent two years in Tanzania. And I arrived, uh, we arrived in Mombasa, and I, uh, we went to the uh, Catholic uh, cathedral, and I heard Gregorian chant sung by the uh, African by the Mombasa uh, Catholics. And it sounded completely different than Gregorian chant, which I just had heard a few uh, months earlier in Germany. And then we went to Marangu, which is at the foot of the Kilimanjaro, where we, my father's seminary was. And they sang Lutheran chorales, which are new inside out. But again, they sounded so different uh, and much bigger and much more passionate. And it, it, it was in every way different. And I was always curious, how come they sing so different? What, why, did, why is it so different? And my father, who was a very, uh, 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 very well versed and uh, was an anthropologist, ethnographer, and so on, was unable to help me. He just said, they, they, sound, they sing different, that's all. So uh, when I finished my last book on memory, I decided that I needed to figure out where, uh, where, why is it so different? And I was curious about the missionaries who, uh, who introduced this music to Africa, and I went to the mission archives to research this further. And very quickly, I realized that they all, or many of them, had a, a strong ethnomusicological background, and that I needed to find out where they came from. And this is why they, I have it first, the first part of my book deals with the history of ethnomusicology because they were most of these missionaries were in contact with uh, the Berlin Photograph Archive. They made recordings for them. It was very important. So first of all, I, I went to an American boarding school in Tanzania and uh, I, without knowing a word of English. And uh, of course, this is how I learned English. It was a wonderful school. I'm still in touch with them. And also with these projects, many of my classmates helped me. They mostly come from the Midwest. And then, of course, we returned to Germany and I studied at a conservatory uh, for four years. And then I um, got a, a PhD in, uh, in America, in historical musicology, and my first book was on uh, time signatures in music, mensuration and proportion signs in Italian theory and also in how it relates to mathematics of the period. Uh, I, we moved, my husband, I met my husband in America, we moved to California and I started teaching in uh, uh, Davis in 1989. is my first book. Uh, that was on the time signatures. I think my book really was the first book uh, on the subject. And, uh, and it is so gratifying. There's a whole uh, outstanding crowd of uh, young uh, musicologists who have continued this work. And uh, most recently, Emily Zazulia has written a wonderful book. I dealt with the practice, uh, with the theory. Uh, Menzo theory and she was a practice. After I finished that book, I spent a year at uh, Harvard Institute for Italian Renaissance Studies in Villa Itati. And there uh, I was together with a very good medievalist called Jan Dolkowski, who's at Harvard, a Latinist. And I started to become interested in the opposite of uh, notation, namely oral uh, transmission. Of course, this is also a great place in Vienna. Was, Ms. Finnegan and all of these people here. So uh, my next book uh, is called Medieval Music and the Art of Memory. And essentially what I realized is that most medieval music until about 15 or even 1600 was orally transmitted. 
what has come down to us is only the tip of the iceberg in writing, but most of it is improvised or composed. And again, uh, the book, uh, I've been very uh, grateful that it has been translated into Italian. It's currently being translated into Russian. So it has had a big uh, audience also in areas where I didn't expect it. For example, in uh, the Orthodox uh, Christians love the book because it explains, I think, for the first time properly how all of Gregorian chant was memorized. So they're using this now in Russia, they're using it in Romania. It's, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> so that was my next project. And then I start, started to move into the, the, these mission archives and history of musicology and history of ethnomusicology, comparative musicology. You know, let me tell you, I remember when my dissertation advisor was Lewis of Lockwood, who's now 91, wonderful man. And I remember when he was president, uh, he gave this wonderful presidential speech saying that all three disciplines should be com much more interactive, should be more combined. And I was a young scholar when, when he gave this speech, but he was so right. And this has always been one of my uh, guiding principles. For me, it is very important. History of theory was always something. I, I, my, I wrote my undergraduate, master, uh, my undergraduate thesis on this subject. But uh, also history of uh, uh, historical musicology uh, and uh, music theory and ethnomusicology just came naturally to me. So for me, this is a natural thing. I don't understand why people ever separated them. It's it's absurd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> completely absurd. It's they, they have so much to uh, learn from each other, and they are such interesting people in all uh, three fields that it would be very stupid to to separate them. Okay, thank you. You know, now this is a this is a difficult uh, question. I think. Um, I think we study any kind of music, and I think uh, we should make uh, uh, people all over the world understand what, that whatever they do is uh, is worthy of study, and that they are that they are. I, I'm actually in contrast to many as a musicologist. I think there is good and there is bad music, and I think these. Uh, Whoever does music, they are very well aware of that. It's not that everything goes. But I think that there, there is so much good music in every part of the world that only if, you, if you're open to understand it. Let me, let me just give, give an example. These missionaries, some of them, when they came uh, to, let's say, Himalaya, they were completely unable to appreciate the local music. Others uh, had fascinating descriptions of the local music and admire it and, and get, things, get things right. So I think one has to have an open uh, mind and make the whole world understand that we are there to understand uh, what music is all about. And music enriches us so enormously. I don't know where I would be without it. That's essentially it, yeah.